Well, I could start with saying it wasn't a very nice place to be. Um, a lot of the children didn't want to stay there. I think a lot of the parents wanted their children to come home, but um, they weren't allowed. I know from stories that my grandmother told me when she did speak of her boarding school experiences that it wasn't a place where it was fun and games and you got to learn. and It was more like you worked most of the time, hard labor, and you went to school just part time. And that was it. So it, it was hard on uh, all of our, our people, all those that had to go. Well, I would say it was forcibly transferring children or in some cases kidnapping children by the U.S. government or by the missionaries and the Christian churches. You know, it was to rip apart the families and the extended families and it was just another one of the policies for assimilation. I would say it's the systematic oppression and genocide of what it meant to be indigenous. The history of Indigenous boarding schooling uh, is a global wide phenomenon and most people um, in dominant colonial society have absolutely no idea really the breadth and the scope um, that, uh, that boarding schools, that residential schools, um, that these forms of educational indoctrination really had on native peoples. Um, that is something that obviously within a colonial framework is deliberately not taught. It's uh, deliberately kept silence because it is a it's a black stain, right? It's a it's a shameful part of the great myth of American Manifest Destiny. Indigenous boarding schools were not to turn out uh, native people who could be enormously successful within the spectrum of colonial society or what was deemed successful by dominant by dominant peoples. It was designed to create a lower class working caste system, with native people serving as the lowest rung of that ladder. Well, there's, there's uh, the history of that and what they was done, that, that definitely affected us emotionally. My mom was forcibly transferred to uh, Piper. She had to go and uh, couldn't come back until she re come back to the summertime where she uh, was given permission to come back. It was hard, hard experience for my mom to be in there, even though she didn't talk much about it but it was being a totally unfamiliar place, taken away from everything that is familiar, from the parents, from the uh, brothers and sisters, and the aunts and uncle, all the relatives, and then all the other elders and people in the community being separated. Growing up in my household, we did talk about boarding schools a little bit, I think because we started to become more aware of them, and we were in a generation that was willing to talk about them. We knew that my great-grandparents had gone, and although they didn't really share stories, by the time I came around, it was more, it was a more open discussion, at least about it being part of our history. From my understanding, the way I see my grandparents' experience with boarding school was just the part of that forced assimilation and something that they didn't want to participate in, something that wasn't their choice or their parents' choice. and. However, they tried to make it sound that it was something they were forced into and something they fought against, you know. So you have my great-grandparents, my grandma, my mom, me. So you have four generations there. Uh, my great-grandparents were fluent. My grandma could understand it. My mom didn't know a thing other than random words here and there. And then there's me left wondering why. So how I conceptualize it is like within two generations, just in my own family tree, the language is completely lost. It was very much these boarding schools existed, these places existed, here are the things that happened at these places, here are the subsequent uh, results of um, language loss, cultural loss, uh, intergenerational trauma. But the actual real stories that come down through my family are something that I've had to really find and really kind of dig at um, as an adult to really, really kind of pinpoint what happened to my grandparents as they went through those educational systems. I feel like my grandparents didn't talk about boarding schools because it was a traumatic ex experience for them. It wasn't something that they really wanted to dwell on. But 
Also, I think that from their generation, they were taught not to talk about those things. They were taught not to dwell on the past and those horrible experiences and the effects that it has on our people. I think that it's something I can very easily look back at now within my family, within my community, and see the effects of. Like I said, there's that internal way they dealt with it and turning it inward with alcoholism and, and other addictions, but also the external. I think that they learned a circle of abuse while they're, they're at boarding school, that they in turn carried on with how they raised their children. Rather than raising children in a traditional way that they were sacred and cherished and never abused, that I can easily see in my community and even in my family how that got altered and how forms of physical abuse, emotional abuse, um, neglect came to be part of how things just were done now. As long as we continue to allow the current dynamic of our land being held by colonizers, there will never be justice for those children who were murdered there, nor for the survivors who got out, nor for the descendants of people who've had to deal with that trauma. If our healing and trauma is contingent on what the federal government says, we'll never feel um, fully healed. If there's any form of reconciliation and healing, one, obviously it starts with acknowledgement, but two, um, the land back or land reclamation. In my opinion, again, as one person, that ownership of these sites needs to go back to the native peoples to whom they originally belonged, right, prior to conquest. Um, but control over what is going to be done with these grave sites, with these boarding schools, with the land that they sit on, is also solely a choice of the native people who have their ancestors buried there. It doesn't actually belong to anyone else. Um, if they want to turn them into genocide memorials, excellent. If they want to turn them into museums discussing the, the horrors and atrocities perpetrated there, great. If they want to burn them to the ground, that's utterly their prerogative. But that kind of thing comes with land return. That the only way we're ever going to really get justice for those children is land return. And that's something that's probably going to be very, very beyond what we're ever going to see for us. If we're going to heal, if we're going to, you know, we try to return to who we were before this, that it's something that we have to do from within ourselves and not depend on the federal government or the churches to, to try to fix it. Because they broke it, they're not going to be able to fix it. We know that those traumas carry forward every generation unless we resolve them, unless we address them. So a lot of healing needs to occur. We know there's still a lot of um, kind of dysfunction in the way that we raise our children, for example. We know that there was corporal punishment in those boarding schools. So if we come to understand that that's not our way and where that comes from, that helps our healing process. Every time we have trauma, every time we have negative experiences, if we don't address that on a personal level, it affects us the rest of our life where we cannot find peace and serenity. Residential boarding schools are genocide and they this knowledge ought to be taught in the schools. It is part of our shared history of all people who claim to be citizens of the United States of America. Thank you very much. I extend my deepest gratitude to all of you.